I want to introduce y'all to my colleagues here. I'll introduce Mike since I've known Mike the longest. Mike and I were in the CMM room together at Eaton. And then next to the left is Matt Matrick. Matt's one of our engineers. Nathan Bichelle is beside him. Nathan's going to Mississippi State to be a mechanical engineer. Yep. And then we have Philip Nettles over here to our left. And Philip's one of our engineers. Good morning, my friends. I already showed you the crash course we went through yesterday. I had uh, friends over, so we were doing a trial run on this, and it did not turn out well. I mean, it cast, but it had all kinds of issues. I didn't even bother cleaning the casting up, but I will on this one. We're gonna take our time, we're gonna do it right. As I said, we had a company over yesterday. We were just demonstrating how the cores work. Traditionally, I would uh, put the cores in the oven, dry them out thoroughly. We didn't do that yesterday, so there was a lot of excessive moisture in the core that was causing all kinds of casting defects. But one of the things I noted was we had shrinkage on the top pad, so we're gonna put a riser on it today. Uh, that's a little too big. I've got some smaller ones here. That'll be the perfect size for that. So, uh, yeah, it'll go on this one, not that one. So these are the cores. I went ahead and made sure they're going to set good and flat against each other. I went ahead and dried them out in the kiln last night, so we drove off all the moisture. I ran it at about 300 degrees for two hours, and then I just shut the kiln off and let them sit there overnight. They had a little additional time to steam out. As for my company the day before, uh, my co-workers from my previous job, uh, it was nice having them out. I got to admit, guys, I'm a little homesick, so it was it was comforting to have the guys come. And Matt, I want to thank him especially. He uh, he stayed up the night before, and man, he he cooked. I don't know how many pounds of meat, and uh, Josie made some sides, and we 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 ate pretty good. And then we came out and we went over uh casting basics and we use this as an example since it did have a core it was a little more detailed and it was pretty easy to understand and see how everything goes together and see how core prints apply to this kind of work i hope we can uh do this again sometime soon one of the guys nate he uh he brought one of those uh it's a digital thermometer, and usually I don't see any of those that go over 700 degrees, right? But this one went, I, I think it was 2,800, 2,900, and we used it, uh, you know, testing it out, and it was very consistent. Whether it be accurate, I don't know, but if it's consistent, I could deal with that. Um, so I'm probably going to go ahead and get one of those. The thing was under a hundred dollars, so uh, it's it would be worth it to have one. I do have a uh, old school pyrometer, but honestly, uh, you know, for the size melts that I do most of the time, what happens is you have to leave this thing in the melt uh, to the point you're starting to develop gas by the time 
all the temperature equalizes. So uh, I like this laser device a lot better. And uh, so you'll probably see me using that soon. So get ready to start seeing some frustration right at the last minute, guys. Keep in mind, we are fixing to leave uh, in a matter of hours as I do this. Mm, I broke it. I was afraid of that. Let's see if it'll stay in place as I turn it up on edge because that's how I'm going to assemble these. Get any loose sand out of there. So I got a slight crack here in the core. I may as well go ahead and make sure that's well embedded. The other side, before I put the core in, I'm going to take and cut out just a little bit there. Crap. Guys, this, this is not going in my favor here. We may have to drill that out. So I guess I got to put another, I got to make another core now. I should have made at least two or three just in case this happens where we wouldn't be wasting all day on this project. But this has got to be done before 3 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> so, uh, shoot. In case I had any sand go down in here, I'll just turn this this way. And we're going to drill that out. So I'm going to set this on the conveyor. And I may as well snap the neck off on the other one too, right? Well, that window held together all right. As I pull this riser out. While I'm at it, before I go too far, before I go to putting the core in, I'm going to put the pouring basin in. Now let's see how much we mess up here. And may as well snap this off. Turn it up on end this way to help get any sand out of there. Well guys, let's do that again. Carefully put some weight on it. And we're going to pour this thing. Already 
after I don't know how many attempts, uh, I decided to go ahead and round two up. This one's most likely going to fail, and it looks like I have two successes finally. We're leaving in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to clean these up and get on the road. Well, guys, I didn't knock the core out yet, but that's what we got. I believe they're going to work. Like I said, I, got, I still got the core in it. I got to knock out, but I've run out of time. It's 2.36, and we're already supposed to be on the road. sounds here. First I'll do this. Jim, you're going to give me a signal. This is a 1908. Uh, who made this car? What's the uh, Rapid Transit Company, the one that ran it? They built it in their own shops. Wow. And I forgot to put my ticket in. We got it straight from Twin City Rapid Transit on the last day of service. Yeah. And uh, we. We started in trips of drafts. Something breaks and we fix it. Okay. Alright. This is really cool. What do you think about it, Jez? be driving it from the other end or yep. I gotta go back here I gotta I gotta be down on this end now
pole comes off the wire and put it up on the wood so it doesn't conduct anything. A good idea. But uh, there, here you can see where the pole is and where right. the wheel and the, uh, the harp is. There we go. I'll just bring the tank. We've got one of these that's loose too. I just thought I'd mm -hmm. take this pull down. So, guys, this is their machine shop, and I recognize several things here. Uh, Lay Keith has been helping them su supply them parts to get this one back going. That's a Van Norman Ram type mill. It came from Honeywell, 1941 vintage. Mm -hmm. So that's a kind of a combination vertical horizontal mill, but it doesn't have a quill like the bridge board over in the corner. Right. So we use it sometimes if we can set it up to mill back and forth. Uh, it's a nice backup. So these are the trolley wheels that ride the cables. And the castings that we made, of course, are right here. And then this wheel would go right in between like that and voila you got power to your to your street car and i didn't get a chance to show you much on these now you see what they do and the little hole is where you hook your cable to help retrieve and pull this down and disconnect it from the main cable this is a kind of a conductive washer um yeah, this is fixed. It's got a little dog here to keep it from uh, rotating. So, yeah, it's so pinned. It, it uh, fetches up on here, so it stays stationary and the wheel turns against it. So it's okay. like a commutator. Yeah, in a and there, there's a conductive spring that goes over here to push the, it's the hub of the wheel. Slip down through here like this. You can feature that. So that's your contacts. That's our contacts. And those just ride up against these sides here. These, these. Like that. Yep. These are Foss Bronze spring fingers, so mix of new and old. These are laser cut. Huh. And we'll form them to to replicate these guys. Okay. They also keep a lot of spares. I've, I've noticed that. Those are journal boxes. Journal boxes <clears throat> for what part? They'll be for uh, 1239. They're actually, they came off of the old trucks. Uh-huh. They were standing on end. Okay. All so right. They, so you'll recognize this part of it. Better. It's yep. kind of a traditional looking... I do you know, now. Boxcar kind of bearing. So that will have plain bearings. Uh, 1300 actually has uh, roller bearings. Huh. Not traditional timpan bearings, but. Now, do they. Well, I see you got a mix of coils and leaves. Right. Do they yeah. take them both? Yes. Yes. And these are, these are all new. Wow. Brand new. So uh, these yeah. came from North Carolina, from Carolina Coil. These came from a shop north of here up near Duluth. Uh, these are called swing links. Uh huh. And uh, they're, uh, there's a bar at the top of the truck frame, and uh, it goes through here, and then this holds the bottom of the uh, big plank that goes across the truck frame. Okay. And that's what these springs bear on ah, all right and then okay. uh so it has some spring and then it swings back and forth the truck the the rails aren't straight never are and the truck wants to wander back and forth and these let the car go straight ahead while the truck is wandering around lots of seats lots of controllers uh-huh and then a lot of things that we depend on people like you to recreate
and you can see behind the, the big gear that it, it drives. George's dad got these trucks from the Chicago Transit Authority and they weren't correct. Oh, you're, oh, you're fine. Oh, somebody took the key out. Well, you never leave the key in the car. You don't. You never a, leave that's it. That's a basic safety thing. I'll give you a horror story. Uh, down at the Illinois Railway Museum, this was maybe oh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh huh. But somebody went into one of the car barns to start up a car, put the pole up on the wire, didn't realize that not only was the key in it, but the controller was, was open a notch, backed oh, up no. on him, and crushed him against another car. Mm. You know. So basic safety is. You know, you make sure this thing is off, no key is in it, and right. the power is off before you put the pole up on a car. And in low life, in my first year there, my it does. To Boston. That looks like mahogany veneer. So I took the Probably is. all the way wow. back and forth. Back then, flying was not really i got to show that. I assure you, it is just That's veneer. Yeah. So where did y'all find the old ads to put in there? Um, they were collected by uh, some, some of our older members who are now passed away. Right. Um, My daughter does not like sitting there long without any way to get up and move around. Now I do have, but I do have a couple that I made copies from the Minnesota Historical Society, and there's one here I want to show you. It's way in the back. Is this wicker seating? Uh, yeah. And they yep. had cast handles. That's nice. She, uh, she flew some from out east up to Alaska in a ticket uh, jet, and they stopped here and picked us up. That's the way to travel. Yeah. Yeah, the one ad I just wanted to show you is this one back in the corner. This one came from the Minnesota Historical Society. It's a copy. But the uh, head of the streetcar company here was from Illinois. Abraham Lincoln was his father's attorney, and uh -huh. he was very much an aficionado of Lincoln. And so Lincoln's funeral car that took his body home to Illinois uh, was sold to the Union Pacific Railroad after the war, and then it passed through some private hands, and uh, Thomas Lowry, the guy who owned the streetcar system here, bought it, brought it into town here, restored it about three miles from here, and put it on display. Uh, I didn't and know that. And then it burned, in, that was in 1905, it burned in 1911, so it burned to the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, you could actually ride to the company streetcar to go see Lincoln's funeral car. Anytime I get to get my hands into a restoration project, it's very exciting, especially when it comes down to streetcars and you get to tour them and get a first class tour behind the scene. I wanted you guys to meet these guys. These guys are the ones that are making this happen. First of all, Ernie, do you want to start off? Yeah, I'm Aaron Isaacs. Uh, I've been volunteering at the museum for 47 years. My dad's one of the guys that started it. Uh, I don't do anything on the technical side, but I'm the chairman of the board and the historian, and my job is to come up with enough money that these guys can fix the streetcars. Jim had his hands in the, the design of the pattern that we cast for this project. I, I worked at it for probably two months because I'd do something and I'd say, nah, that's, that isn't getting it. And I'd throw that out and I'd uh, try again. And then the computer says, no, I'm not going to do that for you. Yeah. And then finally I got to the point where I could do a pattern. And and in my mind, I thought it was going to work. And I think Clark is it worked it well. It did work. So. Now behind me, I have Dennis. Well, I come from a materials background. I'm a metallurgist by trade. Uh, so I guess it was my urging to make this particular part out of uh, silicon bronze rather than uh, malleable iron, which is what it was made of originally. And there's a little bit of short supply, particularly in limited quantities. So uh, the part actually is electrically conductive. It's part of a, uh, a train of components that carries electricity from the overhead wire down to the motors. Uh, so it was appropriate. So we're pleased with the way it's come out so far. And uh, 
we had some machining to do, maybe some modification, but uh, we're pleased as much. Well, it's been a fun, fun journey for me. So we're anxious to see how these uh, machine out, and I'm, I'm excited to see them actually in use. Okay, well this is the Russell Olson Library. Before 2015, we didn't actually have a formal office or a library uh, to handle the history artifacts that we have. And so, uh, up on the shelf here, uh, I guess I can show you, up on the shelf are uh, Russell, Russell Olson's uh, uh, research papers. Uh, Russ is our member, our senior historian. He's 90 years old now. Uh, he did the basic research on the history of the streetcar system, and he put his notes in a really beautiful form. Um, he's the one who wrote kind of the Bible on Minnesota streetcars, electric railways in Minnesota, back in 1976. He then did an addendum, and I've been following on and doing additional books based basically on his research. Uh, we've also got a lot of material here. This is the Kreuzberger notes on the Duluth streetcar system. Other things that are around here, if you look up at top there, uh, that's a braille map of the St. Paul streetcar system from the Society for the Blind. Here on the shelf we've got a whole series of uh, models that some of our late members have made. And here's, this, this right here was donated out of the blue. This is a horse car bell. Well, back when there were horse-drawn streetcars, uh, back in the 1880s, this would hang around the horse's uh, collar, uh -huh. and as he walked down the street, he would just make a little bit of noise. Well, That's be. a really rare item. Yeah. Uh, over here, um, there was a guy named uh, Zaluski who liked to collect transfers, and in these uh, in these little loose leaf things is one of every streetcar transfer from 1891 till the streetcars quit in 1954. Wow. Down here are the schedule department log books from uh, the streetcar system. Um, up here are valuation reports where they, this is from about 1919, where they would bring in a consulting engineer to inventory simply everything the streetcar company owned. Uh, so, you know, we got a lot of stuff. We have a library of books on streetcars uh, all over Minnesota. This is not, to use the museum term, accession. This is not part of our permanent collection, but it's here as a resource for our members. Uh -huh. uh, we have back issues of our magazine over there. And then we've got lots of small artifacts in here. Like this, for example, is a license plate for a streetcar from 1953. Rule books. There's a lot of different things in here. Uh, got a here's a here's a changer right here because mm -hmm. they gave change on the streetcars. Um, and all kinds of stuff. We got about fourteen thousand photographs uh, that are archi archivally sleeved and all in a photo database. They're also on that computer over in the corner. We're doing a book scanning project. That's what that funny looking rig is. Flat files are full of all kinds of oversized technical drawings from Twin City Rapid Transit. And because they're a pain in the neck to deal with, yeah. um, we participate in the, what's called the Minnesota Digital Library. About half the states have a digital library, which makes it possible for small museums to get their artifacts uh, scanned and online and keyword searchable. And some of these things are like eight feet long by three feet, and they have the scanners to do it. And so every one of those has been scanned and is online, so you can use it. Uh, you know, you don't have to go digging in the file to try to pull it out and put it on the table. You can bring it up on your computer screen. Now, guys, I forgot to mention this, but they have, the, the museum began uh, in 1962. 1962. And uh, they have been going strong ever since. Yeah, we've been running streetcars for 51 years, since 1971. Mm -hmm. And we also, we have a YouTube channel. There's some 50 different videos and slideshow presentations on the history on that. Um, and we're going to be tying one of those in on the end of this video. So sure. I want and, uh, be sure to like and subscribe to, to their channel we as publish well. publish books. We publish a quarterly history magazine. Um, That's the one I'm taking home. I'm sure. glad I saw that. <laughs> I almost forgot it. Yeah, please do. And... Uh, so, you know, the whole point is to try to get this history out and make it available to the public. Right. This right here, that's actually one of the badges that were uh, issued to the women 
in World War II. Mo uh, the men were called motormen. They didn't know what to call the women. And so they said, we're going to call them operators. We're not going to use some gimmicky name, but they wound up being called motorettes anyway. Motorettes. Huh? Motorettes. But that's the badge that they were given to wear huh. in their hat. Hello, my friends, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I thoroughly enjoyed it, along with my wife and my dog, believe it or not. Dollar really had a good time as well. I want to thank the guys at the Minnesota Streetcar Museum for all their help in putting this video together, along with uh, helping me get this project done. Be sure to check out the Streetcar Museum's link. Uh, click on it. Watch their video. Get educated on the streetcars, as I did, and I find it quite humorous, educational, along with all the other videos that they have out there. If you're interested in streetcars, they tell you all about it. I'll talk to you later.